This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers and the reading on corporate structures and ownership. This reading could be taken right out of an introductory finance textbook, perhaps even an accounting or management or even a marketing textbook. The difference is that this reading is substantially more thorough and complete. And I find a little bit of irony there because those of you who looked at the end of reading questions, you'll find that there are only seven of them there. And the Institute has actually thrown some short essay questions in there, one true and false question in there. Um, so my guess is that the Institute is thinking that it's gonna use this particular reading as kind of background and foundation for some questions that show up in other readings and other LOSs. And I think the most likely, the most likely outcome is from a capital structure question. Because essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at the balance sheet of a business and we're trying to determine what that right hand side of the balance sheet looks like. And you'll see that as we go through these three learning outcome statements. So compare business structures, compare private and public companies and compare the financial claims. So that last one there, the third one, compare the financial claims and the motivation of lenders. That's clearly the right hand side of the balance sheet. And then as we work our way up into the second and the first one, we'll see that they have elements of the right hand side of the balance sheet in them as well. So let's go ahead and start with that first LOS, business structures. So how a, a business is organized influencing day-to-day -day operations. When I teach my undergraduate, uh, we call it managerial finance, I begin the semester by asking the students, and now remember, my students, they're juniors when they get to my class, so they've had all these other business classes. And I ask them a simple question. I say, tell me what a business is. What does a business do? What are its goals? How does it operate? And so the Institute, you know, pretty much answers that questionnaire in the first couple of pages or two. And so there are four factors that's going to determine a business structure. Uh, the first thing is the legal identity. Uh, here in the United States, um, uh, corporations and businesses are required to have some kind of a charter and they file that with, uh, with the states, with each individual states. And then part of that is, you know, what happens on the right hand side of the balance sheet? Who is liable um, for the business's uh, activities and its debts? So business liability, it could be limited or it could be unlimited. That's a key uh, differentiating factor there. And then of course, down on the bottom right-hand side of the balance sheet, we have the ownership, you know, that's called the equity of a business. And then uh, here's one area where we'll go ahead and flip over to the income statement and say, all right, we've got revenues from the business. We have a bunch of expenses from the business. And then we have, you know, let's just for lack of a better term, use the general uh, idea of uh, taxable income. And so uh, some entities pay taxes and some don't pay taxes. Uh, most of them try to avoid taxes. All right, so quite simply, I'm guessing you know this from your undergraduate business days, the sole proprietorship. This is where an individual has a terrific idea, an entrepreneurial spirit, a risk taker, and that idea could be for a product line or a service, and that uh, that owner of the business probably also own, uh, operates it and is probably the original employee and probably the, probably the only employee, at least for a short time period. Um, you know, here's a key factor. Look at that second purple bullet point. They do not have a legal identity. They're considered as an extension of the owner. You know, so skip down. The profits generate are taxed as personal income. The owner keeps all the financial uh, returns and bears all the risk. Now, of course, there are lots of sole proprietorships out there, but as many entrepreneurs realize that, you know, maybe they need some help. And so they enter into a partnership. And so the uh, the partnership looks, and let me go back here really quickly. The partnership looks, you know, almost identical to a sole proprietorship, except, you know, the business is chopped into however many, uh, however many partners there are. Look at that fourth orange one. Business returns are shared by the partners and profits are taxed like personal, uh, personal income. So there's that big similarity. Uh, between a general partnership and uh, and the sole proprietorship. Now go down to the bottom there, two types of partners. There's the general partner 
and the general partners have unlimited liability and they are responsible for managing the business. Limited partners have limited liability. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get to uh, the next slide or two. But think about it in this way that uh, sole proprietorship, you know, unlimited liability, same thing holds true for general partnerships. If there are general partners, a lot of times they're referred to as, uh, as the GPs. Uh, now there are more complex arrangements in general partnerships, but as I've said to you before, you know, the Institute is not really asking us to be uh, legal scholars, uh, but they're asking us to have a good foundation. And this slide is a pretty good summary of that. Um, what are some features of this general partnership? Uh, capital contributions. All right, so the equity of the business is provided by a handful of individuals, and they probably have an expertise in some area. Uh, the general partner probably is the uh, individual who manages the business and has unlimited liability. Um, but then the limited partners, they, they, probably, they probably don't provide any expertise. I mean, they might, but they don't really have to. And a lot of them just, you know, have kind of a hands off kind of an attitude. But clearly they don't have business control. I mean, they can provide input and then they have, uh, they have limited liability. But all partners are entitled to share in those returns and then skip down to the very bottom there. There's no legal identity. The partnership agreement regulates uh, the ownership. Now, what's probably important for us inside of, boy, I'm gonna go ahead and say level two and level three, not nearly so much in, in level one, is look at the examples up in that embedded bullet point number two. Examples, private equity funds and hedge funds. And at some point in our level two and level three, we'll go ahead and talk about, you know, carried interest and the risk of investing in hedge funds and the responsibilities of hedge fund managers and what private equity firms do. But for now, I think if you just think about them as this, you know, kind of a, a sense of a general partnership. Now, here's this concept of limited liability. In other words, if you if you uh, if you invest, you know, let's just pick a number, say one hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's the most that you can lose. Um, and so the idea is that one hundred thousand you're in and then that's uh, that's the limit. And then those if their losses exceed there, well, then uh, they have to be borne by borne by somebody else. Now, the reading does have an interesting uh, comment somewhere uh, in this in the section between general partners and corporations. Uh, the sentence reads something like uh, the corporation is a newer kind of form of this limited liability concept. And I never really thought about it that way, uh, but it makes perfect sense. So we're moving on to this corporate form of business. And this is important here. Look at that. Uh, look at that red bullet point. Corporation is a separate legal entity. The dividends then paid to the owners are, of course, taxed as personal income, which is similar to what we've had before. However, however, the corporation as a legal entity is taxed before those dividends then flow out to its owners or its shareholders. Uh, look down at the bottom there. Uh, tax disadvantage. Uh, double taxation. This is one of the first things that I tell my undergraduate students that, uh, of course, the corporation as this legal entity uh, pays taxes as the legal entity and then any dividends that are paid. And remember now, dividends are, are declared and paid by the board of directors. And so the board then decides if those dividends are going to be distributed to shareholders under which those shareholders then have to pay a second tax. Yeah, look down at the very bottom one there. Business risk. Remember, we've defined business risk as kind of, uh, you know, kind of a catch all generic term for uh, anything that goes on on the left hand and the right hand side of the balance sheet, mostly on the left hand side of the balance sheet. But there are some elements over on the right hand side and that's shared by uh, all of the owners. All right. Types of corporations, not for profit. I'm sure you guys know this, you know, so there are you know, hospitals, uh, religious affiliations, uh, charitable missions, and they're not usually driven by profits. Um, however, however, I, I, I believe this is my own, my personal thought is that, uh, 
the most successful, or at least the more successful nonprofits, uh, although they're not driven by profits, they, they're run as a business and then therefore they're more successful from a financial standpoint. You know, most of these nonprofits, you know, they have a board of directors and of course uh, they have employees, uh, some of which are paid, most of which are paid, some of which are paid huge, huge salaries. And those are fascinating articles that show up in the Wall Street Journal. I say this regularly, you should be reading the Wall Street Journal every day. Now, one of the big difference, of course, is that a nonprofit does not have shareholders and they do not pay dividends because they don't really have, they don't really have a net income. You know, at, uh, at the college where I teach, we have statements of financial position and nowhere in there is some term called net income. I think we call it, uh, you know, a statement of changes in net assets, which is kind of like something similar to profitability, but, but not really. And there we go, Harvard University uh, down at the bottom. I, by the way, I don't, I don't teach at Harvard University. Uh, how about public and private for-profits? All right, so think about this. The bottom right-hand side of the balance sheet, that's the equity portion uh, of the right-hand side of the balance sheet. That represents the owners. That represents the ownership. So that ownership can be privately held. And I always think of a privately held company as one that's uh, started by a founder. And then uh, that founder's uh, husbands or wives or children or grandchildren or cousins, you know, they kind of get in the business. And so it's family owned. So I think a private company, although they don't have to be family owned, that's, that's kind of an okay way to think of a, a private for-profit business owned by a family. And of course the family could be five people or it could be, it could be a hundred people. And the ownership could be, could be divided in, uh, in, you know, uh, among those in, in any way that uh, the founder or the, or the owners uh, decide. Uh, I always think of one of my favorite all-time TV shows. You guys weren't even born when Dallas was on and J.R. Ewing was the chairman and the president of Ewing Oil. And uh, the family members, they owned the bits and pieces uh, of the company. Uh, there's your homework assignment when you don't have anything else to do is go watch an episode of Dallas from the 1970s. Now, the difference then with these publicly held corporations is that those outstanding shares are owned by people and institutions, let's say outside of the family and let's say outside of the area. And let's just say these are global investors. And so you think of a company like, uh, you know, like Johnson and Johnson or Procter and Gamble or McDonald's. I mean, they, they have, you know, let's say 10 billion outstanding shares. So clearly there's no families out there that, uh, that own, uh, that have 10 billion shares outstanding. Now, lots of public companies, of course, are listed on some kind of a stock exchange like, like the New York Stock Exchange. Now, look down at the bottom there, the legal identity of a corporation. This is what I was saying to you earlier. Corporation is formed by uh, articles of incorporation that are filed inside of uh, here in the United States, inside of one state. And the state of Delaware is, uh, is the most popular state to incorporate because they have fewer rules and fewer, fewer regulations. Now, let me swing back to that family owned business. You know, it's probably many of the family members, they operate the business. And so there's really no separation of ownership on the right hand side of the balance sheet and control of the business. But that's not true with these large middle size and even small publicly held corporations, there's clearly a separation of ownership and control. So I want you to think about it this way, that the investors on the right hand side of the balance sheet, and we'll talk at length about the bondholders and the shareholders here in just a second. Let's just think about them as investors. What do they do? They provide capital to the executive leadership team so that the executive leadership team can make investments. And remember, these are known as capital budgeting investments. We'll talk about net present value and internal rate of return in an upcoming recording. Uh, but essentially what those shareholders do, the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet is that they provide all of this capital. I mean, tons and tons of capital, you know, tens of billions of dollars to the executive leadership team. 
And that executive leadership team then uses that capital. They're supposed to be good stewards of the shareholders' capital to run the business, to invest in positive net present value projects. And of course, the board of directors has a handful of responsibilities. We talked about this in a, in a separate uh, in a separate reading, where the board essentially has two functions. The first function is to is to let's just say develop and establish and maintain the strategic plan, the strategic direction of the business. You know, I promise you that uh, somebody that worked for Johnson & Johnson, you know, let's say, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, I mean, might've been 100 years ago, came in and said one day, you know, hey, look, we, we make these syringes, right? And we ship these syringes out there to all these other people and they fill it with liquid. And, you know, there's some molecule in that liquid. And a board member at Johnson & Johnson probably said something like, you know what, why don't, we, why don't we fill it up with our own stuff? And so, of course, this then uh, you know, evolved into the COVID vaccine and where we currently are in the 2020s. So what was I saying? That that, that, that board establishes the strategic direction, you know, which product lines are we going to pursue? But then the other thing, uh, the second function of the board is to hire and fire executives. And, you know, regular readers of the Wall Street Journal, I hope you read this with as much interest as I do. I mean, I, you know, of course, I never like to see somebody lose their job, but I'm always interested in why they lose their jobs. And so uh, the board will hire and monitor and evaluate and then fire uh, those uh, those directors. I'm sorry, those uh, those executives. So, so what the board has the responsibility to make certain that they put together not only a business culture, but a risk culture and a compensation package to the executive leadership team. So the interests of the executive leadership team aligns with the interest of the shareholders who are those providers of capital. What's the goal of the business? We're going to learn this in multiple, multiple uh, readings that above all, the goal of the business is to maximize the value of the firm to its owners, maximize shareholder wealth, comma. But of course, of course, we need to consider all of the stakeholders, which are people on the top right hand side of the balance sheet, like the creditors and employees, and then the supply chain on this side and the supply chain on that side. Now, what this means then is that the corporate form has tremendous access to global capital markets so that when it has an idea and it says something like, you know what, I have this product line or a service and I know it's going to be super competitive and super financially successful, but I need $1.8 billion. I need it today. Well, they access the capital markets and the investment banking firms. And they help raise that capital immediately so that the com competition doesn't beat that firm to the market. Now, the risks in a corporation, of course, they're shared all over the place by lots of people on the right hand side of the balance sheet. But the owners have limited liability. Um, if you invest ten thousand dollars in. Oh, let me just pick a stock. How about Enron stock? You guys old enough to remember Enron? Suppose you bought ten thousand in Enron in 1997. And by the year 2000, that ten thousand dollars would have been worth. Oh, I'm going to make up a number. How about zero dollars? That wasn't worth zero dollars, but it was worth uh, maybe two or three dollars. So the most you can lose is the amount that you invest in. That makes perfect sense. Now, what do these shareholders get out of becoming an owner? You know, clearly, if you're a family member in a privately held business, you have lots and lots of advantages, lots and lots of perks. But but why would I become a shareholder in a company like uh, like Hershey Foods? Well, what that allows me to do is it gives me the right to vote at an annual meeting. It gives me some other rights at uh, at annual meetings, but it gives me a claim on the boy, I'm going to be really careful here. I don't want to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say this. It gives me a claim on the earning stream. And that's from a, an accounting standpoint. But what I would prefer as a good finance professor, I'm going to say it gives me a claim on the cash flow stream generated by the assets of the business generated by all of those product lines. Now, the 
the reading emphasizes, and well, it should, that the owners have this residual claim, meaning that, you know, let's suppose that the, uh, let's suppose that Milton Hershey sells a whole bunch of chocolate today, and he has, you know, let me just pick a number, a round number, $100. So that's revenues, right? Well, what does he have to do with that revenue? He has to go on the left-hand side of the income statement and pay all of those people who provided some kind of a service, including employees, including supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever's left over, whatever is left over, the residual claim, then the board, the board of directors gets to decide whether that residual claim should be paid out entirely as a dividend or if some of it should be retained and reinvested back into the company. All right, here's one of my favorite uh, parts of this reading and one of my favorite lectures to give to both graduate and undergraduate students. Are right, you, you ready for this? So let's think about the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And let's look at a company like, uh, well, let's just pick Milton Hershey. So what does Milton Hershey have on the left-hand side of his balance sheet? He's got tons and tons of equipment over there, right? Machines that make chocolate bars, whatever those things look like. He probably owns some cows, right? He probably owns some land and some grass and all that good stuff. And so the question then becomes, how does Milton Hershey pay for all these things? Well, there are two things. Milton Hershey and all corporations, they regularly issue bonds. So that's the second part there, borrowed capital. Now, it could be in the short term, but the emphasis here is probably more on the long term. So think of this in terms of a bond issue or and a bond issue are typically longer term, like 10 or 30 or 50 or 100 years. A note issue is maybe two or five or seven years. But we don't need to distinguish between those other, other than their time element. So what does Milton Hershey do when he borrows money from the bondholders? He makes essentially two promises, right? He says the, the, the bondholders are going to say, here, Milton, here's our money, but tell us what you're going to do with it. So Milton Hershey says, oh, I got this chocolate machine. I have this great chocolate bar in mind. I'm going to use it to maximize your wealth by increasing the, uh, uh, the spanning of my product lines. So as bondholders, they say, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Milton Hershey, he knows chocolate. But the second, the second part of that promise is the following. Milton Hershey says to the bondholders, I promise to pay you interest and I promise to pay you principal. This is a legal and binding contract. I always tell my students to think of it as an explicit promise that is enforceable by the courts uh, in, throughout the world, but especially here, here in the United States. So think of that bond issue as an explicit promise by the issuer. Now, suppose Milton Hershey issues additional shares of equity. Oh my gosh, this is completely different. Are you ready for this? Milton Hershey says to the shareholders, hey, I need a bunch of money for these chocolates. So the shareholders have the same reaction that the bondholders do. They say, oh, of course, we know that Milton knows chocolate, so let's lend him our hard-earned money. Milton Hershey then makes the second promise to the shareholders, but it's very different than the promise made to the bondholders. The way I describe this to my students, and I'm going to describe it to you, is that Milton Hershey makes a vague promise to the shareholders. Milton Hershey does not say, I promise to pay you a dividend. I promise you can buy low and sell high. No, no, it's a vague promise. Milton Hershey says, look, I'm going to do my best. And if I'm successful with the sale of chocolate over here on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, as it relates to the top right of the income statement, then I might pay you a dividend and you might be able to go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and buy low and sell high. Ah, that's a vague promise. And that's the level of extra riskiness that the shareholders are willing to take because inevitably the dividends and the capital gains, right? The buy low and the sell high, those two combined are going to exceed whatever interest payments that the bondholders receive. So remember, remember that the shareholders are exposed to greater risk than the bondholders and therefore they're going to require greater, greater compensation. All right, look at the bottom there. Look, taxation, of course, we already talked about uh, double taxation. So there's a, there's a tax expense on the income statement. And then that residual claim that I was talking about a few moments ago, if the board decides to pay a dividend, 
to the shareholders, then the shareholders have to report that, uh, at least here in the United States, on April 15th. And by the way, when, uh, when uh, the board declares and pays a dividend, you can't reject it as a shareholder. Uh, you have to accept it. Even, you know, in the old days, you would get a check in the mail. Even if you decided not to cash the check, if you said, oh, no, I don't want to pay, I don't want to pay taxes on that. I'm not going to cash it. Well, uh, the IRS doesn't really care whether you cash the check or not. All right, how about raising capital uh, on the uh, uh, on the, the right-hand side of the balance sheet with public and private corporations? All right, so what do public companies do? What they can do is they can just issue shares. Now, the first time they do it, it's called an initial public offering. We'll talk about that in a slide here shortly. Uh, but what happens is that this private company initially offers shares to the investing public. And so this is, I want you to think about it, this is where a private company becomes a publicly owned company. But then over time, corporations, they issue bonds all the time. We just did that on the previous slide, but they issue additional shares of stock. And this is commonly known as a seasoned equity offering. And so what happens then is that the company raises money, you know, throughout, uh, throughout and over time, when it has these projects that it wants to invest in, and then the investors out there, they can, are you ready for this? They can get their money back by going to a secondary market. And of course, the most famous of all secondary markets is, uh, is the New York Stock Exchange. Now, private companies, they do this in a similar manner, but of course it has to be completely different because we're not going to appeal to every potential global investor out there. Uh, we need to privately place them. And you know that word private placement, and the correct term is a, uh, of a, is a private memo here, but what, what uh, it, it sounds almost like secretive, but it, it's not secretive. And so if I'm, you know, if I own Jim's Concrete Company, and, uh, you know, it's, it's me and my wife and, you know, some of my children and my nieces and nephews and a cousin, you know, we, we're privately held. You know, if we need money, what I can do is I can pick up the phone and I can call, I can call a bank or I can call an investment banker and say, hey, you know what, I want to issue a bond or I want to issue a note or I want to issue some shares of stock. I'm willing to sell some of the ownership. You know, so I might own 10%, my cousin might own 15%. Well, maybe maybe I'll reduce my ownership to 5% and maybe he'll reduce his ownership to 10%. So we're sh selling a part, uh, or maybe even all, but mostly a part of our ownership. And so how, how do we do this? You know, well, we have to figure out and probably use the help of an investment banking firm, uh, but there's not too much regulation going on but we probably need to identify what's known as and what the reading emphasizes as accredited investors. And these are people that probably ha are wealthy and have a bunch of money and have a history of investing in, uh, in private firms. Now here, I think I've, uh, I've already mentioned this here. So public companies, what happens when their shares are, are issued to the public, they're probably traded on an exchange and this is this is a secondary market. And so in the secondary market, you know, if I'm if I'm what did I say earlier, Milton Hershey or Johnson and Johnson, you know, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, Milton Hershey's not there. And uh, Johnson and Johnson, neither one of those two guys are there. These are really just buyers and sellers. And here I want you to I want to link back to what I was saying earlier. These are really buyers and sellers of the vague promise made by the executive leadership team. You know, if I show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and I'm selling my share of Milton Hershey stock, I'm essentially saying, I don't believe in this vague promise anymore. Somebody who buys it comes along and says to me, hey, Jim, you're a nut. I love Milton Hershey's vague promise. I will buy those shares. So I always tell my students to think of the secondary market as the market for kind of used, I'll put those in quotes, you know, like a used car or a pre-owned vehicle. So these, these secondary market shares have already passed through the primary market. And then what determines the value of these shares? Well, what determines the value is whether or not investors believe in the vague promise made by Milton Hershey, which, and we'll learn this in a future recording, has everything to do with what's going on inside of the Hershey company, and it has everything to do with what's going outside in the macro economy.
So the value of the shares, this is uh, the value of the firm is oftentimes called the total market capitalization. All we need to do is take the stock price times the number of outstanding shares. And so I'm guessing that those of you who do read the Wall Street Journal or pay attention to any of this kind of stuff know that lots of these companies are, uh, are valued, have market caps in the tens of billions of dollars. And oh, during the last year or two, uh, I think there were three companies that had total market capitalization at one time that exceeded a trillion dollars. There's your homework assignment. Go, uh, go do some research and see who those three are. I bet you've heard of those three companies. Now, we're going to learn uh, in, especially in level two, but I, uh, a little bit in level one, probably not so much in level three. We're going to learn about these two old time economists, uh, Franco Medigliani and Merton Miller, who had a really awesome paper published in 1958. Even I wasn't born in, uh, in 1958. But what they taught us, and, and their paper really created this discipline of finance. What their paper taught us was that the value of a company is a combination of the value of the debt and the value of the outstanding shares. Now, they didn't use the term enterprise value. That's something that just kind of came about in the last couple of decades. But look at that equation there in the middle. Enterprise value of a company is the value of the bottom right side of the balance sheet and a section of the top right portion of the balance sheet because Medigliani and Miller were the first ones to realize that the value of the assets, at least initially, comes from the, the initial proceeds of a stock issue and a bond issue, and then what value added do the managers bring to that capital? You know, right, if we have, you know, if, if, uh, if we are a company and we borrow, let's say, $50 in debt, and $50 in shares. So we, we have $100 over on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. We'll just call that cash. So let's suppose we invest it in some kind of an asset and that asset is very profitable and it pays off over time. All of a sudden that's worth 500 on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Well, what did, uh, what did the executive leadership team do? It turned 100 into 500, and that enterprise value gives, gives us a sense of you know, the skill set of the executive leadership team. Uh, private companies, I guess you know this, they're not listed on an exchange. Um, and if you want to buy shares in a privately held company, you probably have to go through uh, a lot of hoops to do it because lots of private companies are not for sale. But this is this is what private equity firms and venture capital firms do. You know, they span the economy searching for privately held companies. And then they go to those privately held companies and they say, all right, we think your company is worth this, no this number. Let's say it's 100. And if the family thinks that the company is worth 500, they say, you know what, come back some other day. But if they think it's worth 40, then they say, oh, hey, we're thinking about selling. So look at what we have at the bottom there. Find a willing buyer. All right, how about registration and disclosure? So public companies, they've got lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of filings, lots and lots of reports, lots of requirements that probably goes through the Security and Exchange Commission and they have to disclose and we'll learn about this when we talk when we look at those uh, i think it's the four readings you know we do the income statement we do the balance sheet we do the statement of cash flow so we'll talk about the disclosure and all those important things uh, private companies you know they probably don't have nearly the same nev uh, level of regulatory and filing uh, requirements that public companies do, but of course they need to file tax returns and they're still not allowed to lie to us. Uh -huh. All right, how about what I was saying earlier about going from a public company to, uh, I'm sorry, from a private company to a public company. So I mentioned this initial public offering and there's lots and lots of really great things about an initial public offering. And so essentially this is what happens here. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a broad a broad brush of a stroke, but you know, this will give you the sense of what happened. Let's suppose, what was my company's name? I'm Jim Cement Company, right? And, uh, and I want to, I want to become a publicly held corporation because I want to raise lots and lots of capital. 
right? I've only been able to grow, here, I'll do it this way. You know, I've been able to grow like this. Can you see my hands getting a little bit? You know, I've only been able to grow like this, but I want to have super growth. So I need lots and lots of capital. You know, the banks are tired of hearing from me. They say, you know what, Jim, we've lent you as much money as possible. So it's time to go out to the global equity markets. And so I pick up the phone and I call an investment banking firm and I say something like, hey, you know what? I, I, I need a whole bunch of money. You know, what do you think my company is worth? So they'll come in and they'll say something like, you know what, Jim, we think your company is worth. Let me just pick a number, you know, a thousand. And so we chop that up into all these shares. Maybe they'll let me retain 10% of ownership, maybe 51% ownership, maybe 0% ownership. And depending on the method, the investment banking firm, they may just send me a whole bunch of money today. So I get my money very quickly and then they have a right to sell my shares to the investment investing public. Or they might say something like, you know what, we'll send you your money after we see what the demand is for your shares uh, in, in, the, in the public market. And so notice what we have in the bold there in the middle, the investment bank underwrites these, uh, the sale of new, of new shares. And so the underwriter sometimes takes lots of risk, sometimes just takes a little bit of risk. So look at the bottom embedded bullet point, proceeds from an IPO go to the issuing company. Yep, so that makes perfect sense. How about this concept of a direct listing? So let's suppose that uh, I'm still Jim's cement company, but I have a tremendous reputation and I have cement trunks all over, cement trunks all over the place. I have a brand name. And so what I could do is I could call an investment banking firm and say, hey, let's do an IPO. But I'm guessing that most of you guys know this probably better than I do, that it's not cheap to hire an investment banker for an IPO. You know, they may charge 8% or 10% or 12%, and they might not even charge a percent. They may just take some of the capital for themselves, uh, you know, based on size or based on some other factor, but usually a percent of size. So what if I don't want to pay the investment banking firm uh, all, all of that, 8 or 10%? Well, what I can do is I can have a direct listing. I can just go to the New York Stock Exchange and say, Hi, hey, I'm Jim, and I have a brand name cement company. Now, the New York Stock Exchange is going to, they're going to do lots of research on me. They're going to go out and say, okay, you know what, Jim, I'm not sure if I ever heard of you, but let me go out and see, you know, and they find out, oh my gosh, when this construction company, when this construction company, when all, all these construction companies, they love Jim Cement. So I have to have a brand name. And what happens then is that the, the New York Stock Exchange will just start selling my shares. One day they'll say, okay, Jim's Cement Company, JCC is our, and I don't know, there's probably a JCC uh, ticker symbol out there. JCC is out there and we're, we have all of these shares to sell. And so buyers come in and they say, oh, you know what, I'll buy at that price. And you know, if nobody shows up, then I don't, I don't raise any money. I don't get anything out of it. And then I'm embarrassed completely. And so you see the point there. I have to be, I have to be a brand name. So there'll be lots and lots of investors who are willing to, uh, to uh, trade those, uh, to buy those initial shares. So direct li listing, it's very similar to an IPO, but it is way uh, cheaper for firms to get their shares, to get its shares listed on an exchange. And, uh, and so what do we have there? We have cost effective. And then of course, what can happen is that a private company may go, may go public when it's acquired by a large public company. Of course, uh, you read about this all the time. When I was in graduate school and then when I was starting to teach, you know, Microsoft was, you know, a company that was this big, you know, back in the old days and now you know, how, how big is it? But it, it grew through tons and tons of acquisitions. Go to the Microsoft webpage or just do a search and say, who has Microsoft taken over uh, over the last 30 years or however many years it's been? And there'll be, there'll be a million firms out there. Of course, I'm exaggerating when I say a million, but most of these, in fact, I'd be willing to say all of these companies were just, you know, small entrepreneurs who had an idea and they're bought up for 10 million or 20 million or 500 million or whatever it is, acquired by a large public company.
Now, as we move through the program in level two and level three, and a little bit in level one, we'll talk about these special purpose vehicles, which you know are, are really, really cool things. If they're done properly, and if investors perform their due diligence and figure out all of the risks involved, now historically, there have been some special purpose vehicles that have not been totally truthful and honest with us as investors. How about if I swing back to my Enron example from uh, 20 or 30 minutes ago. Uh, but now, nowadays, there's this relatively new thing called a special purpose acquisition company, which is, uh, you know, this is created to specialize in, uh, in taking over other companies. And so we'll, we'll have great conversations in the future about these. But for now, I think what's on the slide is sufficient to handle that LOS. But moving on here, they, there's a trust account and uh, when these investors provide the capital in this trust account, they really don't know what the outcome is going to be, but they know that they're going to be searching for companies, mostly mostly private companies. Notice in that second, I'm sorry, the third arrow point there, we have comments on social media. And so I always like to emphasize that when the reading emphasizes that because I know almost nothing about social media because I don't, I don't have any of those things, nor, nor do I want to, but I am willing to agree that they are important. Uh, life cycle of corporations here. So this is so easy. You ready? You ready? They start out like this and then they go like this and they grow and then they stop growing. Right. So that's uh, that's pretty much the life cycle of a company. So let's go through a couple slides here. So the startup, you know, nothing less than an idea and a business plan. Business risk is extremely high. That's probably uh, a pretty good exam question here. Uh, there may or may not be revenues. Cash flows are almost always negative. And the important thing is that there's probably more capital required so that the company can grow. And so that's an important concept here. So you have the idea and you've convinced a handful of people that this is a potentially highly lucrative idea. But remember, your mom and dad and your cousin they only have so much capital, right? And so you're going to have to find somewhere else to go. And this is where venture capital firms come in. You know, a venture capital firm will pick, let's say, 10 startups and throw, you know, let's just say $100,000 at each of those 10 startups. That's a million dollars, knowing full well that nine of them are going to fail. But that one could be Microsoft. All right. So what happens then? You know, we, we get this capital and then we start growing. And that means that we're going to start having positive cash flows, eh, at least positive revenues, and we'll probably have lots of expenses. We, we should have positive operating cash flows. We may or may not have uh, positive net income the way the accountants look at it, but uh, we're, we're growing and moderate business risk. Now, as we keep growing, we keep growing, then we're probably going to reach a point where we don't really need as much external capital because we can fund any kind of growth internally from the operating cash flows that we have generated. We're going to have great conversations about the difference between operating cash flows and free cash flows. Boy, that's a, going to be a great exam question. And this is a good way to start off your thinking about the different types of cash flows. Um, I, I'm always questioning uh, the second diamond point there. Company is profitable. I agree with that with positive and predictable revenues. All right, so let me go ahead and take a step back. Clearly on the exam, you need to say something like, yes, these, these revenues are more predictable at maturity. And I'll give you a good example here. You know, if Milton Hershey decided to wake up today and, and make, I'm just going to pick a number, say 10,000 Hershey kisses, what does Milton Hershey know? He knows with pretty high degree of certainty that he can sell those 10,000 Hershey Kisses. So that's why that's why these revenues are predictable. But I'm a little uncomfortable with this statement saying predictable. I'm going to say relatively predictable because there's so much uncertainty. You know, just think COVID. How many uh, how many Hershey Kisses did did we all eat during COVID? I, I don't know. I didn't have any. Right. I didn't. I didn't go to Walmart or Target. You know, I didn't go outside of my yard. I was outside all the time because I wanted wanted to get outside. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't buy any Hershey Kisses back then. So relatively predictable revenues, but make sure, make sure that you think about the brand name, right? If it's a brand name, it's going to be more predictable than, than, uh, than a non-brand or an off-brand name. 
Notice that embedded diamond point already said that they can internally fund its growth. That's probably a really, really good question. And then if they do need to borrow, if they do need to issue a note or a bond, then they can probably have favorable terms, right? Because we have brand names, we're a bigger company, we have less business risk. So investment banks and commercial banks and private equity, I mean, all that stuff, they're probably going to be able to lend to us at... Uh, at favorable terms. And remember, favorable terms essentially means a lower interest rate. Now, what happens is that when we get to be mature and bloated, you know, we have all this attack from the competition out there. And so we're in some kind of a decline. What that means then that, boy, we're probably going to look elsewhere. We're going to look for new product lines. Maybe we're going to start acquiring other companies. And that's when business risk starts increasing. And those we have in the bottom there, reinvent itself. And so, you know, just do the little ball. So we're tiny and then we grow and then we shrink. And then hopefully, hopefully after this stage, we have an executive leadership team and a board of directors that this decline period is like, you know, let's say one week. How about going from a public company to a private company? I wonder, those of you who are good moviegoers, there have been a handful of really, really cool movies out there about leveraged buyouts or management buyouts. So with a leveraged buy, let's start with a management buyout. These are when the managers of a publicly held company get together and they decide to buy out the shareholders. So the managers, then they buy out the shareholders and they're going to be, of course, now the owners of the company, but they're also going to continue managing leverage buyout that means somebody else you know they're going to use they're going to use debt that means leverage right and these are people who don't work for the company so that's probably the big difference and probably the most likely uh the most likely exam question uh, from this part of the los skip down to the bottom there of course either the leveraged investors there's probably a group of them or the managers, they feel that the company shares are overvalued, I'm sorry, are undervalued on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. How about some trends here? Emerging economies, number of public companies is increasing uh, because there are higher growth, rate, growth rates. That's in emerging economies. In developed com, com, uh, economies, it's just the opposite is true. Uh, I think I've said to you guys before that but I can't remember what year it is. Here's your homework assignment. What year was it when the Wilshire 5000 had over 7000 stocks in its index? You would think it would have 5000 stocks, but it had over 7000 of them. I, I think this was like 1995 or something maybe 1998. But nowadays in the 2020s, the Wilshire 5000 has 3,800 some, uh, some stocks. So we have a shrinking public uh, listing. You know, there are lots and lots of reasons for that, but probably the best reason is because of onerous regulations. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier about the lenders and the owners and the difference between the explicit promise and the vague promise. So look at that first orange bullet point. The debt holders, the bond holders must be fully paid before any distributions can be made, before any dividends can be paid to the shareholders. All right, so let me just remind you, what do the bond holders get? They get an explicit promise. I promise to pay you interest and I promise to pay you principal. But what do the shareholders get? They get a vague promise. The promise is, look, I have a lot of people ahead of you in line that I have to pay. So if I'm successful and profitable and I pay off all my creditors and I pay off all my bondholders, I might have enough money for left over to pay you a dividend and you might be able to go to the New York Stock Exchange to buy low and sell high. So that might, that might word in there, that of course is the, uh, that is the golden nugget of explaining the difference between risk of being a shareholder and the risk of being a bondholder. And notice what we have there in that middle bullet point, residual claimants, right? So that makes perfect sense. Here, a couple, of, uh, a couple of reviews here. We need to look at some illustrations in the next couple of slides. But I think I've said most of this uh, on this slide, right? Uh, equity holders capped at their investment level, right? No limit on the gains. So there's tons and tons of upside, right? You can buy, uh, you can buy Microsoft at $10 a share and sell it for $1 million a share if it ever gets there. Uh, 
course, uh, course, before it would get there, we'd probably have a couple of stock splits in there. So no limit to the gains. Um, investment risk is higher for the equity holders than the bond holders. Stocks are riskier. Okay, we've said all that stuff here. Let's take a look at a picture of what this return profile looks like for a shareholder. So notice uh, on the vertical axis, we have a zero. And then in that, what is that kind of a light red or a light pink color? That's the amount of our investment, right? So what happens here is that as long as we pay off, all right, future value of the firm on the horizontal axis, as long long as we are making another enough money to pay off the bondholders, right? Value of the debt, value, and we get over to that kind of break-even point, then we move up to that area on the far right. You know, what does that look like? Kind of a triangle there. And like green, there's that unlimited upside potential. And so remember that we only get to that unlimited upside potential after we paid off the bondholders and the shareholders. Now look over in the gray box over there. Equity holders are interested in the continuous maximization of the company's net value, net of course, net of course of the uh, of the bondholders. So here's another summary page. So priority claims, we talked about that. Uh, upside gains, you know, the interest payments plus the principal. Uh, but there's an interesting concept about uh, the difference between bondholders and shareholders. The bondholders, are you ready for this? This is a great example. Um, the bondholders, they want Milton Hershey to wake up every day and make tons and tons of Hershey kisses because, what did we say earlier? It has low business risk, highly predictable, relatively highly predictable revenues and cash flows. That stability in cash flows then means for the bondholders that they are more likely to get their interest and principal payments. So remember this, bondholders want the executives to invest in low risk, brand name projects. Shareholders, on the other hand, they say something like, look, investing in uh, in Hershey Kisses and Hershey Chocolate Bars, that's all well and good. We want you to continue to do that, but we want you to take some of those cash flows and we want you to invest in other kinds of product lines. And the great example of this for Hershey, for Milton Hershey, is that one day about 20 years ago, Milton Hershey woke up. Now, of course, I keep pretending that Milton Hershey is not. I know that Milton Hershey is no longer alive, but... Uh, one day he woke up and said, you know what, my breath stinks. Uh, let's, uh, let's manufacture a mint and let's call him an icebreaker. So think about this. You know, the market was thinking, man, what does Milton Hershey know about bad breath? Well, it turns out he knew a lot about it, right? So this icebreaker product line was a high risk product line. The bondholders were not happy about this at the time. The bondholders said, wait a minute, what if we lose all of that money? The probability that we're going to get our interest in principal payment has just fallen. The shareholders, on the other hand, they said, absolutely, Milton, go for it. Let's go out and try to fix bad breath out there. Because if this is successful, then our residual claim has more value, of course. So shareholders want the executives to continue to pursue branded product lines, but they want to offshoot into riskier projects. So there's your another homework assignment. Go to the Milton Hershey product line and you'll see things like cereal. You'll see things like Jolly Ranchers. You'll, think, you'll see things like licorice. You'll see candy out there that you've never heard of. And you'll see other product lines, but these are the higher risk projects that the shareholders want. All right, so let's take a look at a picture of what is the return on the bondholder. You know, what's the what's that light pink on the bottom left hand side? Well, that's the value of the bond. So what do we know? We know bonds. We buy bonds for let's just say a thousand dollars. So what's the worst that can happen as a bondholder? Well, you can lose that one thousand uh, dollars. It's probably not likely that you'll lose the entire amount because a judge will order Milton Hershey to to sell some of his assets, and you'll be able to recover some of it, but. You know, maybe you'll get $10 or $20 or $50 out of that 1000 So there's that downside limitation. But then what happens then as the company becomes more profitable, then all we get, here's that explicit promise. All we get is the interest and the return of principal. And there's that narrow green band, limited upside. Hmm. Now, what about the what about this concept of 
the risk associated with buying these bonds. Well, we're going to learn in a future reading about uh, the bond ratings agencies who are going to come in and they're going to say, hey, this is a really safe bond or this is a really risky bond. We'll talk about that in, in another slide. But the, the quality of a bond issue depends on the issuer's credit worthiness. And that's probably a reflection of the issuer's ability or capability to repay the debt, but then it's willingness to repay the debt as well. And this depends on what Medigliani and Miller taught us all the way back in 1958, the quality of the assets. I say that in class a hundred times a semester. And that means the ability of those assets, the ability of those product lines to generate sustainable cash flow. And then of course, the quality of the collateral. I mean, so think about it. Uh, you know, if Milton Hershey is putting up his Hershey kiss making machine, right, whatever that looks like, whatever it is, clearly the quality of that collateral is very high because that product line is so successful. And then we'll have a really good conversation on the probability of default and then the loss given default. But for now, just remember these in their generic terms. Probability of default is going to be between zero and uh and 100%, right? So what's the probability of the default on a US Treasury security? Let's say 0%. Uh, what's the probability of default on a super safe bond, let's say issued by a company like Johnson & Johnson? Well, that's probably a uh, probably of, de of default, maybe 2%, maybe 1%, maybe a half percent. And then the loss given default is a function of the quality of collateral. We'll, we'll have way more intense conversations about that in a future reading. But for now, I think those definitions will suffice. Let's go ahead and ask the question about what does all this stuff that we've talked about do for a company's weighted average cost of capital? In other words, what is the interest rate that the executive leadership team pays the bondholders? What is the interest rate that the executive leadership team pays the shareholders? You combine those two in a weighted average. We call that the weighted average cost of capital. Well, this is what we know. The cost of debt is lower. And that's for all the reasons that we talked about, but primarily because of that explicit promise. The cost of equity is higher because of the vague promise, the vagueness of the promise. And then there's the added element that whenever a company issues new shares, it dilutes the ownership. What did I say earlier? Some of these large companies have about 10 billion outstanding shares. So think about going from a family owned business of let's say seven owners to 10 billion. Well, that sounds an awful lot like dilution. Now, this is what I was saying earlier about this conflict of interest. You ready for this? Between the bondholders and the shareholders. Because of the differences between those, here, let me go back here real quick. Because of this thing right here, right? The bondholders, they, they don't really benefit if the high risk projects pay off, right? So there's that, there's that narrow range of the limited upside. But with the shareholders, boy, there's unlimited upside. So there's a natural conflict. And so this is what I was saying. Look at the, uh, look at the, the bottom two diamond points. Bondholders prefer a company to invest in less risky projects with certain cash flows. Think of Milton Hershey and the Hershey Kiss. Bondholders cannot control a company's investment decisions. They can voice their opinion, but what they do is they use the, what these things are called bond covenants. And so inside of the bond indenture, there'll be a bunch of statements that say something like, the company is not allowed to do this. The company is not allowed to do that. The company is never allowed to do this. And some of those things are like pay a dividend without paying us interest, uh, allowing financial ratios to exceed a predetermined level uh, or, or to uh, take over another company or, or, or. So these covenants, they can be positive or negative. And what they do is they try to limit the actions of the uh, executive leadership team to reduce this conflict. And that takes us through our three learning outcome statements. Once again, what I want you to do is I want you to go look at those seven questions at the end of this reading. And I'm guessing that you're going to be on top of all seven of them. So you should feel pretty comfortable about the material in this particular reading. But my, my warning is to think about how 
these questions can serve as a foundation for questions from other from other readings so hey thank you for watching have a great day and good luck studying